high school boys and girls are having a hop at the local soda fountain. Innocently, they dance. Innocent of a new and deadly menace lurking behind closed doors. Marijuana, the burning weed with its roots in hell. Marijuana reform, a relevant topic in every state capital, and for good reasons. Yearly in the U.S., over 750,000 people are incarcerated, and over $7.7 billion is spent to enforce marijuana laws. Recent polls have shown a clear majority of American adults now support marijuana legalization and feel the enormous costs of marijuana prohibition far outweigh the benefits, if any. States like Colorado and Washington have already made the move to legalize it statewide, while Michigan continues to spend an estimated $326 million a year arresting, trying, and imprisoning people for marijuana offenses. There is progress, however, as multiple cities have decriminalized the drug and others are attempting to follow suit in 2013. Also being voted on in 2013 is House Bill 4623, which aims to decriminalize marijuana statewide. On August 14th, I attended a town hall meeting in Grass Lake to learn more about this bill and the importance of marijuana reform in Michigan. Hi Mike, my name is Mike Shirky. I'm the state representative for the 65th district, which covers two thirds of Jackson County and a little bit of Lenaway and Eaton counties. We're here tonight to discuss kind of an open forum on House Bill 4623, which is uh, sponsored by uh, Representative Jeff Irwin, and I co-sponsored it. It is a bill that would lead us in a direction of decriminalizing the recreational use of marijuana. Now, I frankly not don't have a solid position on this, but I do have a solid position on the fact that we need a robust debate on it, because I do think that the probability is high that we're spending resources and spending money uh, for things that we probably shouldn't be. Uh, and so I'm glad, it looks like we're gonna have a great turnout. We got a, an expert here from LEAP, and he's a former prosecutor in the Cook County area in Chicago, and he's gonna speak about his experience nationwide on areas that have gone down this road and what they've, what they've experienced. And so I'm looking forward to a, um, a good hearty discussion and we're gonna get, gonna get started here real, real quick. Hey, young America, we need to talk. You may think this is uncool, you may even think it is bogus, but I want to tell you about something that has everyone buzzing, something that concerns mature boys and girls just like you, something called grass. Not that grass. I'm talking about marijuana. I just really want to talk about where we are now and the small step that we can take here in Michigan to make our state a better place. And that is uh, decriminalization, House Bill 4623. Now, before I get into it, I want to say that uh, I think marijuana should be legal and regulated very much similarly to alcohol. I'd like us to take all of the, the drugs that the people might use or abuse and put them on a continuum of their, their level of harm, their, their level of ability to do damage to the human body, how addictive are they, how potent are they, what kind of intoxication do they cause, and, and what are those actual properties likely to manifest, how are they likely to manifest in society. So um, that's where I'd like to go in the long term, but in the short term, there are smaller steps that we can take. And always in the political world, I, I, I really believe in incremental change, right? Every little step is an important step towards our goal. And the step that we can take right now is to take the step that so many of our communities around Michigan have taken, which is to decriminalize marijuana. To take small-time possession, small-time users out of the criminal justice system and stop spending money on arresting, trying, and incarcerating these individuals. And why do we do that? Well, we do it, uh, I think, really for both pragmatic reasons and philosophical reasons. So I'm going to start with the philosophical reasons, because this is the territory I think upon Representative Shirky and I really have a lot of agreement, which is that this is America, right? This is a free country. This country is built on the idea that people should be able to do what they want as long as they're not negatively impacting their neighbors, right? So uh, based on that core philosophy that is so central to who we are as Americans and why our country has been so successful, prohibition is a violation of that concept. And we learned it back in the 30s. And we're learning it again now. And I hope we can learn the lesson before it does too much damage. Here in Michigan, based on a study from MSU that's actually uh, about four years old now, we spend about $325 million every year in this state arresting, trying, and incarcerating marijuana users. There's also the opportunity cost that we have with, uh, with drug prohibition, especially with marijuana. We have a lot of people in this state, many of them young people, 
who experiment with marijuana in their youth, and you know, uh, they maybe get caught, right? And those people end up with a record often for the rest of their lives. That record makes it harder for them to get jobs. It makes them harder to, um, you know, be successful in their community to be productive citizens. So there's an opportunity cost there for us in the state. There's also the opportunity cost with our local law enforcement. We spend a tremendous amount of money at the local level on, on public safety and justice. I was a county commissioner for 11 years before I came to the state house. I can tell you that Washington County's budget, we spend $200 million a year. About half of that is on police and courts. And it's probably very similar here in Jackson. It's probably very similar in your local community as well. We put a tremendous amount of effort uh, financially into public safety. Marijuana prohibition drives the success of criminal gangs. It drives the success of violent criminals. And it enriches them. Right? So much of the crime we see in our big cities, in our small towns, in our rural areas is generated by fights and disputes over drugs. And marijuana is a big piece of it. So we can have a public safety gain by decriminalizing marijuana, not just by focusing our law enforcement resources, but we could also um, we could also really cut the legs out from a number of criminal enterprises in the state by taking away what is their lifeblood, their financial wherewithal. These violent criminal gangs thrive on this drug money, driving this um, business more and more into the light, more and more into a legal and regulated environment. We have a better and better chance of actually. Uh, uh, Cutting the legs up those organizations, improving public safety, and uh, and, and resulting in a, a, a safer community for all of us. So, so we need to try something different. We need to try something that might have a chance of working, and we need to learn the lessons of history. Right? Al Capone was already brought up. We know that when you prohibit substances, the government simply doesn't have the power to dominate everyone's behavior in their own homes, and it shouldn't have that kind of power. It doesn't, and it shouldn't. Right? And we learned this in the '30s. When the government tries to tell people, you can't, you can't drink alcohol, it doesn't work. It empowers criminal gangs, and it's a huge failure. And it's taken us a little bit longer to get there with marijuana, but I think the public's there now. They understand uh, what the real risks and harms of marijuana are, and they want the government to be honest and to be real and to adopt a policy that might have a better chance of serving our citizens here in Michigan. The plain fact is that... Uh... Uh, none of us know very much about this drug in any uh, uh, verifiable way. Well, Bill, it's been about two hours since you got the drug. How do you feel? Fantastic. Defiant? Not at all. Business-like? Not at all. Sheesh. Friendly? Ah. Uh -huh. This is so ridiculous. Would you be interested in taking part in a study like this again and having oh. the same type of drug? Sure. You would. It's been Any. a very pleasant experience for you. I'll do it any time you want. Do you think it would be any time at all? Do you think this it would be a... any time of the day or night? We found out that the drug makes people happy. It makes them intoxicated and finally makes them sleepy, which is about what marijuana users were telling us happened all the time. I'm with an organization called LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. I'm a former drug prosecutor in Chicago. I'm opposed generally to using drugs unless someone's sick and can benefit from medical marijuana. I'm more opposed to the war on drugs. Richard Nixon was mistaken when he said that drug use is public enemy number one in 1971. The war on drugs is public enemy number one. LEAP is in support of this bill which has been introduced, which is trying to minimize some of the harm on, on the most benign of the substances which we outlaw. And that, of course, is, is marijuana. The war on drugs has three fundamental defects. Number one, it causes what it was designed to present, prevent. We put it in place because we wanted to save the kids from drugs. We wanted them to be drug-free. And so we thought, well, drugs are bad, and we want to discourage it, so let's outlaw it. Well, the irony is, when you outlaw something, you give up the right to control and regulate. So, as a, as a, as, And secondly, you engage uh, the black market forces, so now something that grows on a plant uh, ends up becoming the most valuable commodity on the face of the earth, so kids are quitting school, joining gangs, getting guns, shooting at each other, fighting over who is going to control the marijuana, 
and other drug sales. As a result of the war on drugs, instead of less drugs, we have more drugs. And the irony, again, of prohibition is when you prohibit something, you give up the right to regulate and control it. And drugs are too dangerous not to control and regulate. So we in this country and the world now seize drugs by the ton and we prosecute them by the gram. How, how much calculation do you have to do to realize that that doesn't add up? Two, not only does it not work for its intended purpose, but it's the heart of nearly any crisis you can name in America. You name a crisis that you're concerned about here in the state of Michigan, and the war on drugs makes it worse. The kids are tempted to do the wrong thing because we slide a pot of gold next to the choice we tell them not to take. Then they're fighting with each other over who's going to control the sales. They're shooting each other because one corner can be worth $60,000 in drug sales a day. And, and then because they shoot each other, we gotta, we got to put them in jail, convict them. Then we got to build prisons to the point where we can't pay for schools. In, in the state of Michigan, uh, the, the support of higher education, I understand, has dropped some 15%. There are some 55 school districts on, on the deficit list where, where it's anticipated, according to the, the state superintendent, that they're not going to be able to pay the bills. During the 1990s, the fastest growing housing in the United States was prisons because of the war on drugs. The fastest growing housing. If you're a prison contractor, are you in favor of the war on drugs? Well, absolutely. If you have the drug testing con uh, con concession uh, for the courthouse in Chicago, it's worth $21 million a year. Are you in favor of the war on drugs? Well, sure. So... Anyway, in, in Michigan, you've got a $2 billion prison bill, a prison population of some 43,000, and you can't pay the bills. The reason that the pendulum is swinging and you're starting to see people talk about drug policy reform is not because their attitudes have changed about drug use, not because the majority of people don't prefer sobriety, but because government cannot pay the bills for all of these crises that come spewing out of the faucet when you turn the prohibition knobs on. You name the crisis, guns, gangs, crime, prisons, taxes, deficits, AIDS, inability to, to, to pay for health care, kids overdosing. All of these things are made worse instead of better. Number three, the why is something that fails so mightily still in place after 40 plus years? The drug cartels today are in favor of the prohibition of substances. The street gangs in Chicago, which there are 100,000, are in favor of the war on drugs. Why should the good guys be on the same side? Why should the parents who care about their kids be on the same side with the bad guys? Makes no sense, right? If, if the bad guys sport, I should be against it. But instead, we line up with them. If you're one of the 100,000 policemen that got hired because Clinton says we have so much, uh, so much crime, prohibition crime, that, that we've got to hire 100,000 police and you got the job, are you in favor of the war on drugs? Well, sure. If you're the prison, prison contractor with the fastest growing housing in the United States prisons, are you in favor of the war on drugs? If you have that drug testing contract, are you in favor of it? If you manufacture in Connecticut the helicopters that they're using to spray the foliage and, and the marijuana and, and cocaine in Columbia, are you in favor of the war on drugs? Well, of course. If in the town that I come from, they put up a new $4 million police station, it, it doesn't cost the taxpayers a red cent, and there's no bonded indebtedness. If you're the mayor and the alderman and the trustee, are you in favor of the war on drugs? When drugs are seized and forfeited, half the money goes to the local police authority and half goes to the federal government. The, the, the money that comes in can be used for unbudgeted items like buying more squad cars, like battering rams, uh, more weaponry. The, the plane that used to be the drug dealers is now ours. The, the, the boat, the jewelry, the cash is now ours. So law enforcement ends up oftentimes on the side of the bad guys supporting the war on drugs because it's feeding them. Well, I have an idea. Drugs are bad, so let's put anti-drug advertising on TV. The radio will reach every kid over the age of 12 five times a week with these ads. When you put an ad on to say don't use drugs, whether you say don't use drugs or you say do use drugs, it's a drug ad. We spend $400 million a year in anti-drug advertising, which is a boon to the drug business. 
we send the kids through the D.A.R.E. program, and the kids who go through the D.A.R.E. program to learn prevention end up with a higher rate of drug use than the kids who don't go through the program. In drug policy reform, everything works in reverse. You think of something you think would be good to stop drug use, it'll be drugogenic. If something sounds like that's ludicrous, it might work. Everything is counterintuitive in this field of drug policy. So, the long and the short of the three things I'm trying to get you to, to look at in the perspective of this marijuana thing. Marijuana is relatively benign. Umpteen doctors have, have, have said that it, it should be used. The former head of the DEA says, oh, we can't legalize marijuana because he runs a business that now sells drug-free um, drug workplaces to Fortune 500 companies. Meth, cocaine, and heroin goes through the system in some 12 or 24 hours. So if you're in the drug testing business, you're going to get a lot of negatives, even though the guy had the party over the weekend. But if we can keep marijuana outlawed, it stays in the system in the fat molecules of the body for at least a couple of weeks, and we'll be able to get more positives. Now we have more people we have to put into drug treatment. Our drug treater is in favor of the war on drugs. Yes, one of the most difficult audiences to talk to are law enforcement and the drug treater, the people who are riding the drug war gravy train. I'm telling you, the war on drugs is public enemy number one. Drugs are dangerous, but uncontrolled and unregulated drugs are more dangerous. While Representative Jeff Irwin and Leap Speaker Jim Girak both made valid points for marijuana reform, I found the passionate crowd of marijuana advocates to be most moving. Could you name me? My name is Dennis Reed, and I'm a caregiver of the caregiver and patient. I was listening to everything that everybody was saying. I have a real hang up about dealing with medical marijuana in the way that we are right now. And that's that none of us know anything about it. Especially the lawmakers, and they've tried. I sat in on many discussions, and many of you have, with the lawmakers. They researched for years. And yet, at the end of their research, they came in and put more restrictions on medical marijuana patients. It was it's beyond me. Then, when you have your own government that you pay to be in a program where you are, they search through your entire record, make sure that you're a, a, a good citizen to be able to handle this very dangerous drug, marijuana because it might help you. Well, I think, personally, that where we have to start our change is in each and every one of us. And realize that this country made a mistake. We made a mistake in 1930 when Anslinger started getting into this prohibition. It was a trick. They took cannabis, which was in the medicine, and they outlawed it as marijuana. Nobody even knew it. All of a sudden, boom, it's pulled out of the medicine and it's put back into this illegal drug category. Well, I want to say that if the only way we're going to get to those laws is by this shuffling, slowly shuffling, slowly give us an ounce. I want to tell you, as a caregiver, people die if they only have an ounce. Okay? That doesn't work. In fact, under the Michigan law, with only 12 plants per patient, I have a patient that needs a lot of plants because he juices. And this has only been found in recent times that in juicing, using the THCA levels, the acid level, and using the CBDA levels, we're finding what they call miracles on the West Coast. Okay? And in Michigan, there's things happening here too. But if we can have the plant and we can draw out the TA, I mean, just just juice it and take it. No psychoactiveness, no nothing. Just an herb. And it really helps you. We found out in 2007 in California, Sean McAllister and Pierre Dupre in a West Coast medical center found that the 
IV-1 gene was shut down by CBD. CBD, a component of the plant that's non-toxic, non-psychoactive, no problem with it. We have to look at the reality. We have to start with one simple thing. I heard somebody say, tell the doctors. To me, that's like this drug cartel stuff. I mean, tell them, tell them that they're going to, uh, what, lose their professions and, 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 and lose their monies? We have to go somewhere else. And the way we get there is by facing a truth in ourselves. If we look in ourselves and we let ourselves be educated to the medical benefits of cannabis, and we look into the science of it, the real science. I mean, if I could shut down IV-1G with CBD, they found since 2007, it was reported in the Huffington Post in September uh, 2012, that they've been studying it for five years. They found out that the IV-1 gene is real present inside all of the aggressive cancers that we have. So why aren't we using this? Why are we limited in the plant count? That won't happen if all of our heart and all of our compassion and all of our love for all of the people come together and realize we're not hurting anybody. The thing that I really want to ask you people is that if we could change the law, we can do it very simply. Admit our mistake. Just admit it. Study. Get the education. If we find out that the endocannabinoid system can control all of our energy intake, our energy, the, the storage of nutrients, and the metabolism. We can find out all of that. We can find out the, CB, the, the receptors in our brain, in our bones, in our lungs, in, in all of the vital organs. I shut down nerve pain. I shut down bone pain. I shut down epileptic seizures. I shut down my mother's varicose veins for having trouble with them with CBD. So there's a lot there. And the only way we're going to get there is to say, no, this isn't a drug. This doesn't need to be removed from anything. It shouldn't have been there in the first place. So let's join the science and bring in a new health care ability in the United States. Amen. Man, everybody blows pot. Uh-uh. I know this one guy that doesn't. Wait, not that guy. This guy. Oh, no, thank you. Not for me. But I'm high, and it enhances my creativity. No, it doesn't. Look at these paintings. The artist was stoned when he painted these. Those don't look like real flowers. Where I see the problem is all these people making money off of it, even our lawmakers. See, the problem is we've got a Tenth Amendment where the states have rights. The federal government was born out of the states. And just like she said, Arizona, they over, they can overwrite certain things the federal government wants. The federal government doesn't control us. We are sovereign. We control ourselves. That's like having your kids be able to make the rules in your house. They're born of you. They are guided by your rules. The federal government needs to do the same. Number two, we've got law enforcement says, and I can do, i got to follow the law. Unless it doesn't really benefit me, such as uh, the state attorney general uh, shooting, in which he goes, well, yeah, I know they voted on that, and that's a law, but I'm not going to follow it. Okay, so I find the problem laws. Instead of creating more laws, what are you two going to do to start cutting some of the laws out that we have that are just ridiculous? Let's get back to the Tenth Amendment. Let's get back to the people. Stop letting this money go. You know, we talked about some of the doctors. Some of the doctors, if it's medical, why aren't the doctors writing prescriptions from it? Well, because when doctors go to medical school, they don't learn chemistry and learn how to do medicine. Pharmacology companies come in. Drug companies come in and teach them their drugs. And because they're not growing the marijuana, it's not being prescribed by doctors, and I can't go to my Walmart pharmacy and get it. So if you want to talk about it, let's put it into its medical place right there. The other thing is your county sheriff is the most powerful person in the United States. Amen. Know who your county sheriff is. Find out what they believe in. Don't look at what their party affiliation is. I ran as Republican. 
the county sheriff in Hillsdale in 2012. Find out what your sheriff believes. Because the sheriff can throw the federal government out of his county, the FBI. The FBI doesn't get to come in and take one of my cases. They only get to come into my county if I invite them. The county sheriff uh, is the only elected law enforcement officer in the United States, and certainly in his county. So he's the only official that reports directly to the power source. Uh, in other words, he's not a bureaucrat. He wasn't appointed by some other body. Uh, he reports directly to we, the people. And so he is sovereign in that regard because he reports directly to the other sovereigns. The President of the United States cannot tell your sheriff what to do. And so certainly none of the other auxiliary departments underneath the President can tell the sheriff what to do, and that includes the IRS, the EPA, OSHA, FBI, DEA, any of those agencies cannot tell the sheriff what to do. But when they're in his sovereign jurisdiction, he can tell them what to do. The question is, will he? And I'm a big believer in words. Somebody said Congress a little bit ago. Do you realize we call a big bunch of baboons a Congress? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Politics, poly is many blood sucking leeches, and that's the problem. <laughs> we need to understand what John Locke said. We need to get back to what the Constitution really means and said. So you're saying the feds just can't come in and take over a, a, a county base? No. no. Well, he just said they took over his case. Yeah. Yeah. But if and the sheriff, I'll just say, did, did, did you invite him in? I've for 33 years. He doesn't yeah. know what he's yeah. talking yeah. about. Oh, yeah. Officer Brian. He does not support marijuana reform. Let's head back and find out why. The problem that I have tonight is, like you also said, things are counterintuitive. So I'm against your legislation. Sorry. Here's why. You would think that, that you know, it would be a good thing to incrementally go in that direction. But as I, I told Mike beforehand, uh, first of all, as a general rule, we do not go looking for people who are smoking marijuana. If we find people who are smoking marijuana, then they get arrested, things like that. And so generally what we're doing is there's a stop of an automobile because the guy's weaving down the street or for whatever other reason, and they've got marijuana. So we're not spending resources just to go get up. From a law enforcement viewpoint, the concern that I have with this legislation is that right now, if you know, the, the structure has created to some extent, not as bad here in Michigan, and I'll, I'll get on that in a second. But it, it has created a structure where the bad, bad guys are the ones who are behind the, the big drug activities. Okay? And if what we do, I, as I told Mike, I said, we're, we're kind of going at this on the wrong end. Because if our warrants, our, our philosophical basis for uh, saying don't use marijuana because marijuana is bad for you, then how does the production of marijuana hurt anybody? It doesn't. How does the sale of marijuana hurt anybody? It doesn't. Where, where is somebody hurt? If somebody misuses marijuana and goes out and drives, crashes their car, whatever it may be. Same, same with alcohol. It, and production of alcohol doesn't do anything. Sale of alcohol doesn't do anything. Drug drivers kill people. Okay? Uh, so what, what this legislation is doing is it's lighting up on the only people who might be the justification for outlawing it at all. If deterrent effect truly does happen, you're going to increase the demand for marijuana, which is going to put the profits in the hands of the really bad guys that we don't want to have around. So if if we were looking at can we change the world, which everybody's talked about here tonight, if we can change the world, a whole different subject. But just taking this slice and saying we'll make it easier on the user, well you can't have a user without a supplier. You can't have, you know, the whole thing has a system to it. So we can't just take this little slot snapshot out <laughs> and say, this is going to cure the problem. And, and more than that, you take away my best into those bad guys. Because my into those bad guys, as uh, Jim uh, talked about, was, was we get the guy, we get him shaking in his boots, and we say, you tell us where you got the marijuana from. And now if it's, we're going to give you a civil infraction citation, you know, it's like, they go, of course, you know, I'm not going to go mess with that guy for the sake of that. So, 
our ability to enforce the law becomes becomes exacerbated by that. So, in the world we really live in today, having this one change, I think, is negative. If, if we had this different world, it would be a whole different discussion, a whole different story. But that's what I see as a, as a probability and a reality I live in when, like last week, I was going visiting people. We were making making home calls because we had state police helicopters to flying over places where they had marijuana plants growing. And we were going to police home calls. And, uh, and some people were actually doing it right, but not very many. What's that? Uh, I'm doing it right, right? Pardon? What's that? Particular one doing it right, you were hovering over? Uh, they or were very evil. There, there, were, there were some that we that we saw that were all right, but we couldn't see. The problem is, and this is a problem for people who have, especially if you use the real wide fencing on the top of something, like you're supposed to, uh, you can't really see from the air. And, and so we would, we would go knock on the door, we'd ask them, can we take a peek? Take a peek and say thanks, bye. And we got it. Uh, 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 I swore an oath to I have to sort of hold the the United States and the laws of the United States. It's really alarming how many uh, peace officers, policemen, law enforcement officers, sheriffs, chiefs of police who have actually taken an oath of office to uphold and defend, uh, protect and preserve the United States Constitution. And then when you present them with that thought or idea that that's exactly what they should be doing, they claim that it isn't their job to uphold and defend the Constitution, that which they've already sworn an oath to do. We have replaced our Constitution, which was the bulwark of our freedom, in this country with uh, political agendas, political selfishness, and ultimately uh, political correctness has replaced our Constitution. And so it is, a, is it any wonder that we're so far off track? And my message is law enforcement owns part of that problem, and we need to correct it. In the day-to-day -day conduct of your police duties, no matter how or for what reason you're called to investigate a situation in a residence, use your eyes to detect evidence of marijuana, hashish, or narcotic violations. The evidence you're looking for is here, all right. But it has to be located before you can read it. Use your eyes. I'm 19 years old. Am I really causing any harm? I take a topical treatment three times a day. I don't get high off of it. I've never been high off of it. But now I am no longer allowed to use it because the court system decided that oils and topicals are no longer covered under usable marijuana. I want to know what is a marijuana mixture. If oils are not a marijuana mixture, if edibles are not a marijuana, how am I supposed to cure my cancer, my hepatitis, my chronic illness, if I cannot take concentrated the actual medication that I need? They want to put me back on oxycontin. There's 42,000 people that died in Michigan alone from Oxycontin. Do not blame me for not taking the things that will kill other people. There's no way. So we can fight about what should it be legal, what is it? But what I want to fight about is why are the people who are legally doing it right still affected and discriminated, like decriminalized again? Like there's no reason I can be evicted for any any point in time for using medical marijuana. I can't find a job that pays over 7.40 an hour because I can't pass a drug test. And even though I'm like, I'm a medical marijuana patient. Here, I've been a medical marijuana patient. I've never used marijuana in your time. I'm never getting out of poverty. I'm going to school right now for a job I'm never going to get because I'm not going to pass the drug test. So that's what we need to talk about. We need to talk about what happens when people cannot advance further than 740 an hour. We need to talk about what happens then. It starts somewhere, and it starts right there with you yeah, guys. There you go. You know what? There, in many ways, uh, I think three of us pro we're outcasts in the GOP. But you know what? That's too bad. But it starts somewhere, and you know what? Honestly, everyone, it starts with you and I. My friend who spoke on the Constitution is on it, and ma'am, I'm sorry for your pain. A lot of that is caused by politics, but we control it, and the best thing to do from here is exact as follow these guys. We're headed in the right direction. This may be a stupid analogy, everyone, and I'm not going to go on a speech, but 
When you have a curfew at 9 o'clock, all of a sudden your mom doesn't say, okay, it's now midnight. And we are not, we can just not, after years of where we're at, just not jump off the cliff. Slowly but surely. This is the step to the next step. And I mean, these guys are going on a limb for us. We need to back these guys. I've been doing this a long time involved in politics. And we're talking about true representatives of the people. They're not looking at any party. They're not looking at anything but what is right. And I, I applaud Mike, who brought in someone with a different opinion. We all want to just sit around and agree. Is marijuana really where it's at? Is it really as righteous as you think? There is more to life than grass. There are fulfilling careers and Garubi beach parties. The closer you look, the more seeds you find in your stash. Follow your hopes and dreams. Be someone. Do yourself and your country a favor. Don't let this happen to you.